This is going to be kind of like an impromptu test. And I'm going to start out by showing you some pictures. Every single one of these is not going to be uh, what you can see in this photo or no, what do you see in this photo. Some of them I'm actually going to make a little bit of a commentary about what the photo is about. Well, I'm going to start out with this one right here. I took this picture just a few days ago <clears throat> out there at the apartment where my dad lives. Now this vehicle doesn't belong to my dad, but there's a lady that lives there that drives this. And I noticed something when I was looking at this picture, and I was just going to see if when you look at this picture that you notice what I noticed. And just look at that, study it, pause the video if you need to, and do whatever you've got to to look at that really closely and see if you see what I saw. All right. Secondly, this was a pair of safety glasses that I've got. I still use these when I'm cutting the grass. And one day one of my students was grinding on something. And when she was through grinding on something, I was standing there watching her, you know, where she was wearing her safety glasses and all that. Um, I happened to notice a little speck on my glasses. And when I took them off, I saw this little chip right here in the glasses. And if you look at where that chip is, th this glasses right here are some really seriously heavy-duty $600 glasses. Now they're prescription, but they're really industrial-grade safety glasses. Really well made, and you know they're the Z87 Plus 2 or whatever. And uh, whenever the optometrist over there, the eye doctor, gets these glasses that are supposed to be safety glasses in, he puts them in a little jig to hold the glasses and he drops a steel ball on the lens from about six feet. And if it cracks the lens or does something else to it, then he basically sends it back and makes them put, you know, the right kind of polycarbonate safety glass lens in there. Well, in other words, the, these things are rated, they'll almost stop a 22 bullet. Uh, that's how tough they are. This one here had this little skint place on it right there. And I, would, I went up there, and it was after the scratch warranty was over with because the glasses were over a year old. And uh, they told me that uh, one lens for these glasses would cost nearly $300. <laughs> so I decided to just wear the glasses like they are. But anyway, the point is, look at where that is. If, my, uh, if I had not been wearing those safety glasses while that girl was grinding, and, you know, how many times have we all been out there without any eye protection whatsoever when we're doing something that's hazardous to our eyeballs? And, I mean, I actually was taking a battery out of a Dodge truck back in 1979 or 1980 or whatever it was when I was doing fleet maintenance down in Texas. And I put my wrench on the battery terminal and I turned that thing a single turn and that battery exploded. And all of the plastic that would have ordinarily hit me in the face and in the eyes embedded itself in the bottom of my arm and that was really painful surprising scary as all get out uh, but a lot of times even when you're jumping a car off you're putting your eyes at risk because a little I mean I've actually seen batteries just blow up without warning you know and it's not just it's not because you touch the uh, cables together and made a spark over the battery sometimes batteries just blow up that's just the way it is anyway that uh, piece that hit that pair of safety glasses would have gone right into the center of my eyeball and there's no way I'd have been able to see it coming because I didn't even see when it hit the glasses and made that mark. So word to the wise, you might you know think you're bulletproof and this is never going to happen to you, but always wear safety glasses or some kind of face protection whenever you're doing that. Uh, in other words, whenever you're doing anything like that that's you know can, that has a potency to throw uh, stuff at you. Uh, this right here is a judgment call situation. You see how all those heat cracks and all on the flywheel, you know, typically we don't do anything about that. Sometimes people get flywheel resurfaced and all that. Um, but what I was looking at here, this little caged bearing that they have for the pilot, uh, sometimes you'll go in there, really you're supposed to replace that. Getting that thing out of there is kind of aggravating, but there are tools for that. But I have seen more than once where all those needles had disappeared out of there and all that was left was this cage. I've talked about this a little bit before. But I took a carriage bolt and I ground it off flat on two sides so that it had two sides sticking out and two sides that were flat. And that way you can stick it in there and you can hook it just inside that. And then you can use a socket and a washer and a nut and use that to extract that little thing. It works really well. But that little, that little shell is really hard to get out of there if you don't take some careful measure to pull it out of there slowly, if you try to bust it out of there with a chisel and a punch and all that, 
you'll be beating on it for a while. It's just real aggravating. Anyway, but you can take that carriage bolt like I did on that one. This is one I actually took out using that. First time I ran into that was at a Ford place. There was a guy that had gone to Nashville Auto Diesel College. He was a pretty good mechanic. And he had pulled the transmission out of one, and he was trying to figure out how to get that little empty cage out of there. And I said, well, let's see what we can figure up with. And I basically came up with that idea on the fly because I knew if you had something in there, if you've got threads and you've got a washer and you've got a, uh, you know, a socket, which you, know, you can pull that into, the socket's got to be bigger than that, you can put some grease on those threads and you can just about move the world. It's really amazing what you can do with an inclined plane wrapped around a cylinder uh, you know, and a nut that matches that. But anyway... Now this right here is something that you probably won't find if you if you see one that the air conditioner is not cooling good on it or it's trying to run hot and uh, this kind of thing. It won't always be all of those symptoms, but it can be some of them. You know, if you're running hotter than it should and all that. These right here is what's interesting to me. There's these dog fennels and these straw and all this kind of stuff. And this one's not as bad as some I've seen. Will go right through the condenser, and it'll stop between the condenser and the radiator. You may look at the condenser and see nothing there, and that fools you into thinking that there is nothing behind the condenser either. But whenever you look at that, uh, whenever you take the condenser loose or do whatever you have to do to look between the condenser and the radiator with your boroscope or whatever you're using, or lean it back and look, it's sometimes surprising how much crud you'll find down in there. Uh, it's just pretty much amazing to me uh, how sometimes whenever you're wanting to make one run a little bit cooler and you're trying to figure out what's making it run hot, you can basically clean that junk out of there and wash out the flues in the radiator. I've actually removed the radiator from a vehicle and took it out there and you can see that it was all clogged up on the outside. Not to mention the clogging that can happen on the inside. You know, But if, if it's partially clogged on the inside so that only part of the radiator is able to work, then you got issues with that too. But I've laid it out there and basically steam cleaned it kind of. You got to be careful so you don't bend the little, you know, fins over. But just steam clean it and get it cleaned up real good and put it back in. And that's all it took to cool the engine down was to have a radiator that was able to have some airflow. Now that's pretty important. One time, and then we'll pause for a story. There was a uh, Ranger, Ford Ranger, and I'm gonna say it was an '86 model or '87 model. And it belonged to an airline pilot. It was an older vehicle at the time even because he did not want to drive a really nice vehicle and leave it at the airport when he was on long flights because when the longer a vehicle stays at the airport, the more likely it is to be vandalized and all that. And if a, you know, he was a pilot, so he flew uh, a lot. And so he says, uh, but his little Ranger that had a four liter engine in it was trying to overheat. Uh, no, I didn't have a 4 liter. I'm sorry, I had a uh, 2.9, which is practically the same thing as a, a 4 liter overhead valve. You know, the 4 liter overhead valve is a board and stroke version of the 2.9. Of course, there was a 2.8, and that was an entirely different motor, too. But the, the long and the short of it was, I had uh, worked on this thing, trying to figure out why it was overheating. Done everything that you ordinarily do for an overheating vehicle, you know. And uh, work, 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 worked on that thing, trying to figure out what in the sound hell we needed to do to get it not to overheat. And we actually put some probes on the four freeze uh, expansion plugs on the four corners of the heads as they were getting hot first and all that. And, I mean, he just worked on it for a while. This guy was real patient. He was willing to spend whatever money it took. And so I says, look, um, I don't really see there was nothing wrong with the engine, but for some reason it would not I mean, it was running a little too hot. And didn't have any blown head gaskets or anything like that. We double-checked all that stuff. And so I says, uh, finally, and I don't know why these engineering situations occur, but uh, we told him, I said, you know, said, an Explorer radiator in this same vintage vehicle, and this thing may have been a, new enough to where it was just like an Explorer, only it was a Ranger, I can't remember. Anyway, so we put an Explorer radiator in it, which fit perfectly, except it was about three flues thick instead of just one flue thick, which was what he had on that Ranger. And so, uh, but it made a difference, but there was still something not quite right about it. And finally, the shop foreman, he told me, he says, since this is a thicker radiator and the fan is buried up in the shroud so that you can't see the edge of the blades, that's going to make it run hot. So we need to cut about a little over an inch off of the shroud all the way around so that the, the blades are split in the middle. So whenever you look down at that shroud, you should see about half of each blade. 
And so I took that uh, radiator shroud off and I marked it with a piece of masking tape and I used my high speed cutter and I cut uh, half, I mean, an inch off of that thing and I put it back on there so that it was split in the middle and that thing ran cool as a cucumber. Now I don't know why that, all that engineering was necessary, but it was and it, you know, that's what it took to fix it and the guy was happy as a lark. Never had any more trouble with it. Uh, but the reason the shop foreman knew about that fan split in the middle thing was because Ford actually built some vans back in the uh, early 80s or whatever it was and those vans were running hot because the fan was too deep into the shroud and you weren't seeing the blade split in the middle. You wouldn't often think about that. It seems like if that fan was up in the shroud it would still be pulling a lot of air through the radiator but apparently the way that shroud tapers in it must trap some air in there and keep it from flowing the way it should uh, one way or another. That's just a little something that I, I added because it popped into my mind about the time I showed you this slide. Here's something right here. One of my students, you know, when you're replacing a steering rack, uh, it's very, very, very important, and most everybody that's watching this video knows that, to before you do anything about pulling a steering rack off the car or anything else, you put that steering wheel in the dead center, and you lock that steering wheel so that it doesn't move. And when you put that steering rack on there, you make sure that steering rack is dead center as well, because if you don't, if you put it on there, that steering rack is one way or another, and sometimes it may be that way if you're replacing a steering rack with one out of a salvage yard. You need to make darn sure you turn the little uh, pinion shaft on that steering rack is, uh, is just exactly in the middle like the other one, because if you don't, you're going to wind up doing what? You'll rip your clock spring to shreds. There was a guy that was in my class uh, who's basically a successful mechanic in the field right now, and he had his little Honda car in there and he put a rack on it and he didn't pay any attention to where the steering wheel was or anything. The first time he turned the wheel, he destroyed the clock spring and on that Honda it was like 400 and something dollars. Now on the Ford Ranger that I had over there, it was only like 35 or 40 bucks at one time for a clock spring for that one. But the long and the short of it is you need to be careful when you're putting doing any kind of steering work that you don't have the steering turned all the way one way or the other so that it wipes out the clock spring. Uh, Having a, wiping out a clock spring can ruin your whole day if it's a really expensive clock spring and customers don't like to pay for stuff like that. And I can't really blame them. Alright, this one right here, the, the president of the college, he's a real cool guy, he had a, bought a 76 GMC Sprint. And it was a beautiful car. And uh, He was basically, he's an old car buff kind of a guy. He's also got that, you might have seen me on some of these videos talking about that uh, 71 Cadillac Eldorado, that's another one of his vehicles. And, uh, but anyway, this, uh, this one here, I had one of my students to strip the engine down and uh, clean and paint it. In other words, he had got everything off the top of the engine, all the carburetor, the hoses, tape everything up and all that. Took the valve covers off. We got the valve covers stripped down to bare metal. Now, the way you paint valve covers so that the paint won't peel back off of them, and you can say, well, you need to put some primer on them. That works too. You can do that, and I like to put primer on it. Well, what I do if I want that paint job to really last is I'll take those valve covers, and I learned this when I was working to do a fleet maintenance down there when I'd rebuild some of those diesel engines and those forklifts, those Perkins engines. I'd want to paint them, make them look really pretty. And uh, whenever I would uh, take that valve cover, and I was going to paint that because I had seen, I had built other engines, and when I put painted the valve cover and put it back on, the paint would crack up and peel off, and I always hated that, you know. But what we do was, we would take these things and we would strip them down and get all the paint off them that we could. If we could get it all the way down to the bare metal. And then we would set these things up and with a, using a heat gun. We would heat that valve cover up so that it was absolutely blistering hot. Too hot to touch with your hands. And then we would mist the primer on there and get a good coat of primer on it. And while it was still hot, you know, that primer dries really quick when that valve cover is really hot. When that, and you can do this with an oil pan too or any piece of metal you're painting. Uh, you know, the, you got to have a good heat gun though. And uh, you know, I, I have actually stood it up and put a bottle torch under it, you know, but the heat gun works better because it puts out more heat in the broader area. And so then you fog that paint on there real evenly and real thin while that valve cover is really, really hot. And if you do that, that paint will stay on there a whole lot longer than it will if you just prime it and paint it. Now that's just, you know, that's my little uh, method of doing that, you know, whether you want to do that or not, it's up to you. Most of the time, though, when we paint something, we want it to stay painted. We don't want paint peeling off of it. 
Anyway, that turned out to be a beautiful job, and he's really, really happy with it even today because we did what I was talking about, and the paint has stayed on the valve covers instead of cracking up and peeling off. Jeep, for a while, back in the really uh, the late 80s, I was trying to scramble around and uh, meet some kind of environmental regulation that they came up with and uh, use, and I think a lot of these uh, OEMs are using water-based paint now for, you know, for environmental reasons. But they use some water-based paint painting the engines on some of those J10, I mean those uh, Jeep Grand Wagoneers, and those doggone things, uh, the paint would crack up and peel off and they would rust and the boss man had one over there, the dealer principal, he bought a brand new one and it just, the engine was tr looking to turn into a mess, paint was coming off and it was getting all rusty, and so he had me to strip everything off and paint that one, you know, with some regular wall-based paint or whatever, and so I went ahead and did that and, you know, took care of that. You know, if you think about this, if he was actually going to sell that thing to somebody, you know, they were coming looking for a used vehicle, if you open the hood and you see an engine that's covered with rust because the paint came off and it looked like it came from up north, that one was sold here in the south and we don't have rust issues in the south like they do in a rust belt. And I got to, my hat's off to everybody, if there's anybody listening to this minute, uh, video that works in a rust belt, I've worked on some vehicle that came from up there and there's nothing easy about it. Uh, so kudos to you guys for putting up with all that and being so tough because you got to be tough when you work in a rust belt on cars where everything is just rusty, rusty, rusty. All right, this particular thing here, I wonder why this didn't work. How many times have you seen, hey, I don't have any crank signal or I don't have this or I don't have that, and then whenever you unplug it, some yo-yo plugged it in and these pins got bent up so that they, you know, <laughs> weren't connected. And that was an absolutely outstanding performance there. Sometimes you can straighten those out, but a lot of times when you're trying to straighten them out, they bust off. You know, so that's no fun either. All right, this right here was liquid-filled motor mounts off of the 2004 Mercedes, which was no easy job changing those. You had to pull part of the manifold off and everything. It was a booger bear. Uh, but anyway, we swapped out those mounts and got rid of an ugly engine vibration. And these liquid-filled motor mounts will lose their liquid. You can see this one here had collapsed and it was no longer doing its job. That's the new one right there. And so, now this is a good idea. Changing that seal is a good idea. If you've, uh, in a lot of the times, whenever you, uh, for example, you've been, somebody, you know, you're having to pull whatever, you pull the uh, engine out, pull the transmission out, you got to do whatever. Now, when we pulled the engine out, uh, we got to the point over there where if we were going to pull the engine out of a vehicle, we would go ahead and, and drop the transmission out of it first, and then we would unbolt and unhook the engine and lift it out of there, and then we was putting the engine back in, or if it was the same engine or a new engine or, or a replacement engine or whatever, we set it in there on those mounts and get it all buckled up, then we put the transmission back in. Now, anytime you've got the transmission and the engine separated, particularly if it's high mileage, you've got to remember that that button on the front of the torque converter is being supported by the back of the crankshaft, by that little port back of the crankshaft, and the pump is actually, it's basically, it's not putting any pressure on that seal. Well, the seals in that transmission can get old and hard, and even if it wasn't leaking transmission fluid before, you might find yourself in a situation where whenever that torque converter is no longer supported by that little button on the front of it, when you pull the engine and the transmission apart, it'll settle down and distort that seal, which never returns to its original shape because it's got old and kind of hard and all that. So it's really easy to put, find yourself in a set of circumstances where you put it all back together and then you find a transmission leak that wasn't there before and you try to act like, hey, well, I didn't do anything to the transmission. It's just really smart, guys, to make doggone sure you take that transmission, uh, that pump seal out and replace it with another one. Now, on those Chevys, it's got that cage around it to keep it from blowing the seal out because of the pressure. You need to put that back on there, too, or it'll blow the seal out and you'll have a big problem because of that. Changing that seal, if you've had the transmission out or the engine and the transmission separated in any way, is an excellent idea and is always something needed. It doesn't cost very much, real easy to do at this point. When you're holding that torque converter, hold on to that button and spin that torque converter. It's got to go past the turbine shaft, the stator support, and it's got to engage in the pump. So you ought to feel free, click, 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 whenever it's going back in there. And sometimes you'll fool with one, spin it and spin it and hold it and jiggle it and all that. May fight with it a while, but it finally will go back together. If you if you're just patient, you keep working with it. Anyway, this is one of the things that I I was at. Uh, it seemed like everywhere I went, if I was working in an old shop, I'd find one of these things laying there. 
And I was thinking, what in the same hell is that? And finally I got the part number off of it. Uh, 21, you know, I mean, a lot of people would use it for, they'd heat it up, use it for soldering iron, whatever. That's what this, this part number right here, J21552, it's a Kent Moore number. And if, you, if you've ever taken a steering box apart from the old steering boxes, you'll recognize that part right there because all of these balls, actually, it's a recirculating ball nut, and that, you're supposed to stick that in there, and it gives you the opportunity to put all those balls in there without them just making a big mess. I used to have my students take a steering gear apart and put it back together so that it would be operational, just so they'd know how that was done. And we never used this for putting it back together, although somebody came up with this special service tool. You can look it up, J21552, and that's what it's for, sticking it in there. And so you can put them balls in there and lubricate them with power steering fluid and all that, and drop them down in there, and that enables them to go around and around that nut, keep them from falling out in there. You can do it without this, which we always did. But anyway, I thought that was a very interesting thing because I had seen so many of these things. And it was just really something. Um, the 5.4, we had a 5.4 that came in there. It was the last, one of the last semesters I taught. And I had one of my girl students. It was, uh, I gave her the job of uh, doing the work on this thing. And it had to have, it had time and chain slapping and whatnot on it and making a bunch of racket. And so I had to do a time and chain. This tool right here, locates the and a lot of a lot of these vehicles now have got some way of locating the crankshaft exactly where it's supposed to be whenever you're timing it now back in the day whenever you know i used to this this uh, i would always thought that this would always be straight up now this has changed it's not like that anymore uh, and this tool that uh, 525 219 tool is, is actually connects over here and it uh, locates the crankshaft exactly where it's supposed to be when you're putting the timing chains on. And of course you got your timing chain, you got to put both of them, you know, that timing chain and this one on, and they got to be lined up, and we made marks so that they would line up with that, and, and that's kind of what it looked like, you know, when we got it all put together. Now the deal on this, these tensioners, well, one of the things that messes up is these long plastic uh, guides will start to come apart. And you notice this one on that 5.4, and that one are the same design. The tensioners on this side, on this one, and on that side, on that one. I mean, it's, it's on the left side of it in, in both cases when you're looking at the front of it. These are oil pressure operated, and if you don't have over 25 PSI of engine oil pressure, you're going to have issues with time and chain rattle and all that. Now, what usually fails on these, of course, on this one, we put cam phasers, we put time and chains, and the, the guy said he wanted to go ahead and try to fix the engine instead of putting an engine in it. And I told him, if you're going to spend some money like that, you may be disappointed when we're done, but we'll give it a try. And typically what happens is the cam saddles wear out in the head from the ones I've seen, and that causes <coughs> the oil pressure low. This one here, he had us put an oil pump in it, and we put timing chains, we put new tensioners, we put all that stuff on there. That engine ran like a brand new motor, but when it got warm, it would actually, the oil pressure would drop, and it would drop down to where it was kind of low. Now, if you're trying to figure out where the oil pressure is going, one of the things you can do is remove the oil pressure sending unit, and you can put air pressure in there, you know, I'm talking like shop air pressure, and see where it makes the loudest hissing, and that'll be typically where your oil pressure is going. That's a trick I've talked about on here before. Now, this tool right here on that same job actually enables you to take those roller rockers out. Uh, and it's a it's pretty you got you got to know how to use it the right way it, it goes under the under the camshaft and you tighten that down and it pushes that valve down and it basically gets it to the point where you can remove those roller rockers and uh, as a matter of fact on this one we replaced all the roller rockers on the passenger side head because they were all coming apart too uh, but anyhow uh, anyway when it was all over with <clears throat> this this guy right here still had issues with a little bit of low oil pressure problem whenever it got really good and warm. And so basically what he decided to do was go ahead and run some motor honey in it uh, so that he wouldn't have to spend any more money on it. Now, he'd have been money ahead to put a motor in it, but he wouldn't listen to me. He wanted to go ahead and try to fix it, and that sounds good, but, you know, you're always going to get in over your head when you try to do that. And, uh, but th he signed off on this. He wasn't upset about it. He went ahead and let it go. But anyway, that little tool right there is one that's really, really handy on these 5.4s to get that 
throw the rockers out of there. Helicoils have saved our bacon on more than one occasion. This one right here was an exhaust uh, issue right here. It was just totally uh, screwed up and messed up and we had to drill it out and all that and put uh, those in there. One of the things that it's really irritating to me, and some of you guys may run into this, is some of the Chevy trucks in the 2000 era, 2000s, late 2000s era, for some smart aleck uh, character decided that they were going to put um, stainless steel nuts on these things, but stainless steel is just as bad to gall and seize up as regular steel. Brass works good. I don't know why they didn't use brass nuts on that. But then stainless steel nuts, the aggravating part about those is, once they start giving you a hard time, if they gall and they don't want to come off, you can't cut them off there with a torch because whenever you get stainless steel red hot with a torch, it just cools off when you pull the trigger because <laughs> stainless steel doesn't oxidize. And we've had to fight with those things. It's just real aggravating. But anyway, this one right here was one that we fixed, you know, by putting a helicoil in there. They actually make special helicoils for head bolts where you need a longer one too. You can basically look that up on the helicoil website. they got head bolt helicoils that are made for that. Now this electronics uh, sequential, you know, central sequential fuel injection system, you know, the, you might remember how the original setup had the poppets, uh, and those poppets basically uh, had there was the little uh, solenoids up in, up in the little uh, body up at the top, and those solenoids basically uh, gave you sequential fuel injection, but it would deliver fuel pulses to those poppets, and those poppets would respond to the fuel pulses. Now the wacky thing about those, if you didn't have over 60 pounds of pressure, it may not even start. You could have 56 pounds of pressure and that motor wouldn't start because those poppets wouldn't work. But, even at the Chevrolet place now, whenever they work on one of these little CSFI systems, they take that old poppet spider out of there and they replace it with an electronic spider that does exactly the same job only it does it better. This was when we were putting it on my dad's pickup truck. My dad's pickup truck has been sold now to my son Matt and that thing runs really really good. Matt got that pickup for my dad and uh, you know whenever he went to take it back and that, that pickup the story in and of itself you know COVID slowed down the repairs on it and all I had it over at the college where I used to work and all that. That's a long story. <clears throat> and there's other stuff I may talk about later on that. But anyway, when he went to fill that truck up with gas, this was a, a 96 Chevrolet with a 5 liter engine in it, and it was a super cab, long wheelbase, and it had a 30 gallon gas tank on it. And he parked that thing out there at the pump, ran his credit card through there, and he pumped that thing full of gas. It was almost empty because the thing set it in the college so long they had to drain the tank and clean it and all that. And so uh, when he, it was almost empty when he pumped the gas back in it and he put $88 worth of gas in it. <laughs> it was, cost, cost that much money to fill that thing up. But he drove it from here uh, several hundred miles where ordinarily you would have expected to stop and get gas, you know. But he's got a heck of a cruising range, you know. If you drive that thing right, it'll get 20 miles to the gallon with that motor and all in it. And they had, you know, had nice new tires on it that rolled easily and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but he drove here from here all the way uh, back up to Tupelo, and he wound up still having a bunch of gas left when he got there. Didn't have to put any in it. Anyway, but we put these on there, and we cleared up some uh, running problems that truck had. We also had to replace the little, um, the little chip or whatever it was in the uh, VCM. You know, uh, some of you guys don't know what I'm talking about. You've probably been on it, uh, done a lot more than I have on that. But we kept. We got about a, a whole bunch of engine controllers from the salvage yard that the guy loaned us, and we kept taking the chips out of one of or one and another of them. And finally, when we plugged in the one that it ran the best, we left it alone, and it ran so smooth. Um, but what's wrong with this picture right here? I'm gonna let you study that picture just a bit and see what you see. Some of you guys have already noticed what's wrong with that picture. But I'm going to come back to this one and the first one, and we're going to talk some more about those in a minute. This is really the best way to change the fluid. If you've got this uh, the transmission flush machine, you know, the one that we had was uh, really a good one. Anyway, uh, this is the fluid coming out, and that's the fluid going in. Now, the way that we always chose to do that was we would go ahead, before we did anything else, you're going to have to hook up between one of the cooler, cooler lines and the radiator. Uh, you know, or the transmission cooler and the cooler lines, however it's hooked up. And you're basically going to fill up your tank on your machine and you're going to have the uh, 
waste oil tank empty, when you crank it up, the oil that's coming from the vehicle goes into the waste oil tank, and the new oil that you've poured into the other tank goes back in there, so you're replacing it all. After we did this, and we got it where, you know, you have to keep putting fluid in there, it takes a lot of fluid, where both of these are the same color, and you know, good and doggone well, you got some really clean fluid all the way through. Then we would go ahead and pull the pan, change the filter, clean it all out, you know, do a quick look around in there, fill it back up with fluid. It took a lot of fluid to do it, but you had an absolute, I have actually, there was a Cadillac that came in there one time, one of these Cadillac crossovers. And that Cadillac, the brake fluid, I mean, the uh, it, it wasn't shifted right. And whenever you looked at the transmission fluid, I ain't kidding you, it looked like brake fluid. It was a dark, thin, black, had no red to it at all. So I got the right fluid, and we did a transmission fluid exchange on that Cadillac and fixed the transmission. Uh, the president of the college, he had that Mercedes that was supposed to have lifetime fluid. We changed that fluid and fixed the shifting problem. Uh, you know, he got the right kind of fluid for Mercedes. We actually did a transmission flush like you're seeing right here. Had to build some adapters to do it, but that took care of that transmission problem. So anyway, having good fluid in there is a really good first step. You're going to spend some money doing that, but you'd be surprised how many times. I like changing an oil on a 7.3 power, power stroke. It's surprising how many times just doing an oil change on one of those with the 15 quarts of oil that it takes. When you can actually fix a power stroke diesel, uh, the 7.3 model, you know, with, uh, by just changing the oil. Because people tend to go a long time without changing oil because they feel like when it's 15 quarts you can just drive it forever, you know. Alright, this Harbor Freight engine support fixture really impressed me. This thing is so wonderfully designed. And these right here will swivel so they'll rest on your fenders. Now you're not always going to use these every time on a front wheel drive vehicle. You do not use an engine support fixture like this on a Nissan Altima that's in the early 2000s model or you're probably going to push the fender down and make it where it looks kind of screwed up. You don't use that on an Altima. You just don't do it. But on most other vehicles that are front wheel drive, that are transverse, you've got to use that. And this one right here, you notice this whole thing is slotted right here so you can put this anywhere you want to go it's got this nice little turn and I think if I'm not mistaken it comes with two of these too uh, but this right here is slotted and it's longer than the vehicle so I was really impressed I think the whole thing I thought I got seventy five dollars for that thing it didn't cost very much for what we were I mean for I mean but I've used more than a few of these and I've actually built some of them you know for a specialized purpose like if we had several cars in the shop and we only had the one OTC engine support fixture I would actually get a piece of pipe and stuff and we'd do some welding and we would actually build one just to get by because we would have several cars we were pulling the motors out of at the same time. I was really impressed with that one. It's strong. It works well. I got no complaints about that. A lot of people will snort and turn up their nose if you get something from Harbor Freight, but some of that Harbor Freight stuff is well worth the money and this is something that I would recommend personally. All right. This right here, I, when I would go over to uh, the local Walmart, I would see this thing sitting in the parking lot. I had to take a picture of it. This is a 69 uh, Buick uh, Electra 225. Uh, the folks around here call it a deuce and a quarter, you know. But that is an absolutely beautiful car. I don't care whether you like Buicks or GM or Ford or whatever. You know, it's got a little curb feeler right here. They don't have one up here, but they got a curb feeler in the back, <laughs> you know. But uh, that is just, and it's, it looks like, to me, like it's all factory, even the wheels. And I was extremely impressed with that. I just wanted to uh, point that out. Uh, these big old boats like this, you know, have a tendency to bounce over curves and stuff. But boy, did they ever ride. They rode good and they had a lot of power, but they sucked the gas like a thirsty camel. This right here is a ball joint disaster. Uh, this guy, this kid was driving this truck and he was turning in. And it's typically when you're turning in when the ball joint breaks when you're turning. That's when the ball joint goes pop and then it, you know, goes to, and that happened on this one. And so, you know, we had to get a new CV uh, axle for the front, you know, and all that. And I actually, uh, I don't remember, I uh, did a lot of assisting with this job because we had to do it in the parking lot. You know, and here's something else. If you're putting a jack stand on asphalt, you better put something like a piece of plywood under it or a piece of metal like we got here because if you don't and it's hot weather that jack stand can sink into the asphalt 
and unbalance the load. If you put something under it like that right there, you're you're not as likely to see that jack stand dig into the pavement and you know cause you an issue. Uh, but anyway, we wound up having to uh, take care of that problem. And it, it, it looks like a mess when you're getting the job done, but we, you know, we worked it over, got it done, and, uh, and took care of that right there. All right, what do you see here? This is another one of the ones we're going to go back and look at in a minute. Do you see anything that strikes you right here as unusual on this Lincoln? This is a Lincoln. And, uh, it was an old town car. It seems like it's one of those uh, late 90s town cars, if I remember right. Or maybe a mid 90s town car. And I thought this was kind of cool right here. A little video I took of that thing there. <laughs> you know, this is really pretty serious because it can happen without warning. The hose gets breached from the inside. And here you wound up uh, with a situation where you uh, mess up the motor, you know, without knowing that you have a leak. Uh, I had a hose do like this on a Taurus. I was driving back from Mississippi one time, and I had to stop and use some uh, tape that I carry, you know, duct tape and stuff to fix that hose. You can do that just to get by, but it's not good for a permanent fix. This 4.8 liter Chevy was an interesting situation because the guy that was driving it was one of the people that worked at the college, and he was a pretty smart guy. And he told me, he says, this thing just doesn't seem like it's got the power it used to have. You know, and so I took it and I drove it, and I really couldn't say there was much of anything going on there. I mean, it's a 4.8. You know, what do you expect? It's not going to be a racehorse. But then I had to factor in that he had been driving this thing for two or three years, and only lately had he been noticing that. Well, one of my really good students, and he's, a, he's one of these guys that's got motor oil in his veins, and he's really sharp, and he, he was only like 19 or 20 years old, but uh, he, basi he just basically seemed like he was born to be a mechanic. This guy was really good. He was hearing something under the valve cover, and we didn't get any misfire toads or anything, but he was hearing something under the valve cover on this side, and so we took it apart, and it turned out that this particular, we got the, the uh, dial indicator, magnetic thing set up right here, and we set this on top of that, and we turned the engine through, and by doing this right here, which is, this is the lifter is sitting right on the camshaft, we were able to tell by looking at that what the, uh, and actually this is, angled, you know what I'm saying, a little bit. Uh, but the long and short of it was we were able to tell by doing this that that cam lobe was worn off. We looked up the specs and it was supposed to have like 248 thousandths of lift and it only had like 210 thousandths or something like that turning it through. That's a good way to find that. You know, usually if the lobe wears off enough, it'll start popping back through the intake or something like that. This doesn't want to do any of that, but he was feeling, he was hearing a click, click, click right here. Now, if you've got a lifter that's totally collapsed, it's flopping around, you may have some issues with that. But you can still, by turning the engine through, if you got your dial indicator zeroed right, you can tell by watching that thing move how much lift you've got on each one of those lobes. And that's what... Okay, this is a revisit of the first slide. Okay, so what you're seeing right here, notice that back wheel, how it's straight, and this front one, how it's leaning. You're seeing it leaning like that, and that back one's like this. Front one's leaning. If I take a sticky note, it works a little better. See how that works? And if you put this one like that, you stick that sticky note on that screen so that it's lined up with the outer edge of that tire. You can basically see how that sticky note is angled. All right, the interesting thing about that was I told that lady, I, was, I saw her, I said, it looked like you need an alignment. And she said, yeah, I do. And I says, I bet it's pulling to the left. And she says, yeah, it is. She said, my nephew's going to take it and get it aligned. It's been doing that for a while. Well, she's got brand new tires on here. If she keeps driving it like that, she's going to wind up with a worn out tire. That was the first what do you see slide. All right. The next one was this one here. This is not too hard to figure out. <laughs> you can tell that belt's going the wrong way around that pulley. We opened the hood and saw that. It's really amazing how people can figure out ways to put the belt on so that it will be tight enough to work. But sometimes they're wacky enough to be, you know, to put it on there so that the wrong side is pointing at the belt. I mean, I, I, there was another one that we saw that was a Cadillac uh, 
and it had the belt on there, the one in sideways engine Cadillacs. It had the belt in there and just routed any kind of way uh, so that it would work. I mean, it basically worked. One time there was a, a van that was running too cold because the belt was routed wrong and it was driving the water pump the wrong way. Well, that seems to me like that would make it run too hot, but that was running too cold for some reason, or, or they thought it was. All right. This right here is a, was a total a novel thing because it had worn the the disc, the rear brakes had worn out so bad that it just machined that and completed it until there was nothing left but the park brake hat, which, you know, that's really something to see when you're looking up under there. You know, and this right here is for the park brakes right here. Uh, I thought that was wacky as all get out. Anyway, uh, that's a picture of the shop, you know, when I used to teach over there. And um, that was, I got them to send me these little Valvoline things right here that you see from the parts store. I like to hang stuff around like that. And label in the toolbox and all, really good idea. So uh, one way or another, uh, oh, and also this is, we all went out and had a mop bucket. I know we, we mopped up every Thursday. It's always a good idea to keep it clean, you know. Um, but I really appreciate you guys watching, and I hope you'll come back to see me again.